Australia, the largest island in the world with the greatest number of landscapes. A country isolated for so many years that its wildlife is some of the most unique anywhere. Home to only 22 million people from 200 different countries. Australia's a place that's crying out to be explored. And I've got just the way to do it. One year on from my African balloon adventure, I'm in Australia, preparing to settle the long-standing sporting rivalry between Britain and Australia by scooping Australia's biggest balloon prize, the Canoundra Challenge. Supporting my bid is a fine balloon team made up of my African balloon companion, pilot Robin Batchelor, his co-pilot Matthew, a Brit now based in Sydney, Victor, our crew chief and token Kiwi, and Daisy, our red and white candy striped balloon designed by and named after my nine-year-old daughter. Training for Canandra's challenge has taken us on an unforgettable adventure across Australia's southeast corner, taking in South Australia, Victoria and now New South Wales. Preparation started several weeks ago in the South Australian outback. The outback is teeming with weird and wonderful things, both on the ground and, unfortunately, in the air. As we found out on our maiden flight over the Flinders Ranges. Thankfully, it was only Daisy's basket and not us that bore the brunt of the outback's fierce winds, and we were able to push on into Victoria, where we clawed back some dignity. Morning. By acing the Melbourne cricket ground and immediately lost it by offending the entire Greek-Australian population. Told you this wasn't a good idea. Still, we rose above the shame long enough to attempt a flight to altitude. There we are, 10,000 10, feet. And make it very comfortably to the city of Sydney. Canandra's balloon challenge just a week away, it's time for Robin and I to leave recreational flying behind and get competitive. We're southwest of Sydney to get some practice of flying to pre-arranged targets. It's a mock competition, Robin and I versus Matthew. Whoever gets closest to the targets wins. Well, today is our first day, it's like training competition. It's uh, Robin versus Matt, they're both very keen to win. We're going to get up towards the river, we're going to drop down, we're going to try and touch the water, and then um, the next target, we're just going to rise up to around about 500 feet, and that'll take us out towards the bridge. And on the bridge, we're going to have two guys, and they're going to be standing on the bridge with helium balloons, and we're going to try and go over the top of the bridge, and actually they're going to let the helium balloons go, and we're going to try and catch them. After that, we're going to rise up again to about 500 feet. We're going to fly over the top of town and we're going to be able to see the airport in front of us and we're going to try and target right to the middle of the airport. In competitive ballooning, it's not about speed, but how skillful the pilot is in reading and using the winds to reach the target. I definitely think I'll win, yeah, because I'm a local to the area. Because I know the local winds, I've got a huge advantage, definitely. Matt knows this area a lot better, so he has an advantage over that. Robin, of course, more senior, has done many more hours in a balloon. But Matt's like the young pretender. He's keen to uh, show Robin that he's every bit as good. OK, you ready to go? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right. So, well, good luck. You're going to need it. You're going to need no, it. No, you both are going to need it. Even two against one, you've got no chance. Listen, mate, experience. There's no <laughs> substitute. OK, we're away. We're away first. Matt, um, I, I, I can see where the river is, but what do you think? Shall we adjust the target um, to the reservoir? Over. 
right, we're changing the goalposts now, are you? OK, um, well, look, let's do that then. Let's try and get in the middle of that reservoir, shall we? With the winds not in our favour, it's good news Matt's agreed to change the first target. We're all now on course to drop the balloon onto a local reservoir in a manoeuvre that's called a splash and dash. We'll do a splash and dash on the reservoir just to, just to rub it. Just to rub his nose in it. Yeah. I'm all for that. OK. <laughs> OK, we're going to get down there and try and join him. Here we go. He's on it, he's on it, he's on it, and... Splash, he's in the water. Good on him. Fantastic. Well, I think that's 1-0 to us, don't you think, Steve? Yeah. That was a splash. Beat your heart out, Matt Skate. Let's see if we can do the same. Let's see if we can do the same. Here we go, here we go. Coming in, coming in. To be honest with you, I never thought we'd make that. <laughs> that was unreal. That'll be one all, and on to the next target, a bridge about one mile away. The bridge starts there. You do a so I've got to get quick left. climb and drop. Very quick. Yeah. When we get to the bridge, crew chiefs Dino and Victor will release a helium balloon which we're supposed to catch. With what, I'm not entirely sure. Just, uh, Robin, do you copy, Matthew? Go ahead, quickly. Yeah, just wondering if you wanted to change the goalposts again. Up your Here comes D now. Okay. Okay, well there's our bridge. Thanks for standing on it. Come on, baby. Oh, mate. Come on, baby. Ice in balloon! Yeah. I nailed it! Yes! You're the man, oh, Dino! In the middle of the balloon, boys. Well done. Get beyond that church by the yeah. head. And the air, well, the airport's That's right there. Yeah. Victor, what are you doing? I'm going with the wind at the same pace. Victor's over enthusiasm and Daisy's lucky catch makes it 2 1 in our favour. So, Stephen, I need you to help me spot the troopy because that's the yeah. target. We've got to drop the. Um... They're using this glider strip here. Yeah. Where one's coming into land now on right. the grass thing. Got it. They're okay. talking about putting it flat in the middle there. Okay. That. Beautiful, right down on the river. There's the troopy on the move. The balloon truck is the final target. If we manage to throw our marker closer to it than Matt, then we're the clear winners. Just managed to get on the other side of the river here, which is it, things are turning. Um, yeah, things are turning out to look okay at the moment. He's going to throw his marker. He's about to throw his marker. Yeah. He's too impatient. He should have waited. Yeah, you've already thrown your marker. You've shot your bolt, mate. No, 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 no. We're ready. OK, here we go! Ah! Not bad. Well, I'm coming down. Yeah, we've just got to sit just above the ground and wait for it to go that way. Yeah. He's going backwards. OK, a bit of a bend your knees. Three, two, one. Way! <laughs> Surely we've got to go back sometime. Now we're stopping. Robin! Oh, man, he's in beside himself. Robin, we're over here! We're having too much fun! The wind is... That's... We're not going to go back, is it? I think we'll have to land. So where did it all go wrong? OK. And down! Well, you need to explain to me what happened there. Well, the wind... Let us down. The wind let us down at the very end. Honestly, I'm not a sore loser. I'm just overly competitive. I think it's given us a taste for it, but I think uh, there's there's more we can do. We can get sharper. 
now we've had that experience, do you think, Robin? Absolutely. So, with Matt Marker landing 12 feet from the balloon truck and ours, well, not even making it out of the basket, the competition's a draw. Fingers crossed we'll be more successful at Canoundra. I'm in Sydney on the last leg of my Australian adventure. Canoundra's balloon challenge is now days away, so I'm taking a more holistic approach to training. Sports performance experts say you've got to eat to win, so I'm following their advice to the letter and have lined up champion foodie and MasterChef judge Matt Preston to take me out to lunch. The hard thing when you come to Australia to get, get your grips around this notion that really it's five countries. Mm -hmm. You go past Wagga, yeah. Wagga, suddenly everything changes. The beer they serve in the pub changes. The football they discuss goes from AFL to league. Right. So you just so this this is a it's kind of it's a very different culture up here. This is all about the beach. It's all about uh, there's a certain hedonism about Sydney that exists that probably moments a bit more serious mm -hmm. and a little bit more kind of or they like to think themselves, do we say, a little <laughs> bit more arty. Yeah, yeah. So Ben, what, what dish are you going to put up, Stephen? Uh, this would be the uh, the uh, Queensland Spanner crab yep. with the soft polenta, um, and we just flavour it for a little bit of chilli, chopped garlic, parsley, and uh, finish it with some nice. Sorrel. So explain to Stephen kind of what the restaurant's about, the kind of the, the food background of the restaurant. Um, Mediterranean influence, of course, where we are. Mm -hmm. Beautiful by the beach here. Uh, we just try and keep it really light, fresh, seasonal, nice clean flavours. Obviously, you know, the Italian migration was huge in Australia in the 50s. Yeah. This is Italian ideas, but given a real kind of light, modern Australian spin. Australians are um, starting to watch what they eat and yeah. uh, their lifestyle and um, I think Bondi really emphasises that with, you know, people, there's always people running along the beach and swimming in the water and yeah. um, living, living the lifestyle. You know, Stephen, I'm a, I'm a firm believer there's no better way of understanding a city and understanding a culture than through its food. And this is your first step to understanding Sydney. Immigrants and an outdoor lifestyle have played a huge part in shaping modern Australian food, but so too has the variety of climates, making it possible to grow everything from sugar cane in tropical Queensland to apples in colder Tasmania. Mm. May I? Yeah, go on. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. It's fresh, bags of flavour. Mm. That kind of brownie butter flavours and that, that kind of saltiness, the sweetness of the, of the meat. Yeah. Um, and that corny flavour as well is really nice. Mm, that's nice. Yeah. Again, really simple. A, yeah. lot of, a lot of Australian food's not, it's not high technique, it's certainly not in this and restaurant. It just sit, sits yeah. up in the mouth yeah, and that's right. perky. It sits up in the mouth and perky. Mm. Are you a food critic? No. Have but you, you come out that? Yeah, I'm going to use that. Thank you very much indeed. Rain might not work for ballooning, but somehow it only adds to my Bondi experience. As one of Australia's most fearsome food critics, Matt's used to causing a stir when he enters restaurants, but not usually when he's on the way to one. So allowing him to get behind the wheel of our unique truck, it's the least I could do, especially as he's taking me to Key, a restaurant recently voted Australasia's best. So we're, we're building up to this, uh, this competition in Canoundra. Taking on the Aussies in their backyard, is that something that you, you reckon we'll have a chance with? You know, the great thing about the Australians is they're very welcome and open about competition. Yeah. Uh, and I think you'll find they'll be very warm and very welcoming and they'll really, they'll really, they'll really enjoy the fact you're here and then they'll want to grind you into the dirt. Then they're going to want to crack a beer over the top of you and you would do a toast just to really patronise you. Then they'll then ring you and send you photographs of you being ground out of the dirt for the next four or five years. And in fact, what will happen is they'll ring you in 30 years' time and then invite you back just so they can remind you and show you the footage. One congee, one pearls, one lamb, one duck. Let's go. Which 
Chef Peter Gilmore takes rare ingredients and creates beautiful food in a location to die for. I'm looking for success on my Australian adventure, and here's a man who's already found it. What if you get a coach party and ordering all that at the same time? We don't do coach parties. <laughs> I can see why. Yeah, so this is, beautiful. this is our seatbelts. Want to go for it? I've got to go for that. Oh, that's gorgeous. I used to play marbles when yeah. I was at school. <laughs> that's beautiful. Egg white droplets. We uh, use a little um, eyedropper into some oil with the egg white. So, <laughs> something you can do at home, for sure. <laughs> You know, get back to England. What, what are you going to do? Knock, I'm just going to knock up some sea pearls. Where's my eye drop? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's great you see this because obviously what Pete uses is a lot of a lot of native, a lot yeah. of native flowers and native leaves. But you also have to see this one dish you started doing recently, which is a a, a jowl of a peat, pork cheek, yeah, and little maltose skinks. It's great because it's all about the quality of that produce, the, mm -hmm. the the pig, but also it's got a really trendy modern modern technique over the top. Pig jowl for you, and the healthy option, for Mr. Preston. Mr. Preston likes a salad. Well, what we have here is we have a heirloom tomato salad. It's all old varieties of tomatoes, really unusual, uh, great flavours. Um, and then you've got a whole lot of flowers. You've got some elderflowers, some pea flowers, uh, some native violet. Uh, you've got a whole lot of uh, wonderful little herbs there. The salad burnet, some nasturtiums. And I've just got a bit of pig. <laughs> pig face. Pig face. It's actually a Berkshire pig. Um, really beautiful, great fat content, great flavour. It's cooked for 12 hours really slowly. And then we put a, a false crackling over it, which is made from malto sugar. So you get this crisp bite, and uh, you've got some beautiful prunes, some pear. Yeah, I'm getting the aroma. Aroma, from pear, prunes. sherry, prune, prune kernel oil, and um, yeah, and some little cauliflower cream. So enjoy. And all at once. All at once, get into it. <laughs> You've had this before, haven't you? And I'm, I'm going to wash your face when you eat this, because I reckon, I reckon th this is one of the great dishes of Sydney. There we go. It's all right. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, no, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty special to do that one. Well, I suppose if you're a stranger to Sydney, then the, the, one of the best ways to introduce yourself to it is through the cuisine. And all these little infusions that make Australia are there in the dishes. It's one of the most stunning places on earth. You know, that, that unique design of the Opera House, there isn't another building like it in the world. It's so special. It doesn't matter what the weather's doing, the backdrop never changes. Looking out the dining room window, it's hard to believe that it's only been 222 years since the first fleet landed in the very same spot. Sydney's done a lot to shake off its convict past, but it's still a place where mischief happens where things are a little, well, upside down. It's hot on Christmas Day, banknotes are made of plastic, and as the drag capital of the world, more than the average number of men like to dress like women. I'm not sure why drag has had such an incredible popularity in Australia. Meet Graham Browning, the real Priscilla Queen of the Desert. I think one of the things about it is that Australia is so far away from the rest of the world. Right. And certainly in the 50s and 60s, there was an element of, of intrigue to drag, but there was also an element of celebrity. They all became like they were the girls that impersonated Barbara Streisand and impersonated Bette Midler. And these people very rarely visited Australia. Right. Um, and, and, you know, these days, I think there's a larger population and it's, it's worth more for them to come down. Mm -hmm. But in those days, they never came here. So, so we had these accessible celebrities, these people that became celebrities that people could get to know that could chat to, they could see. I mean, much like everything else, we tend to do a bastardisation of the British and the American of everything. Yeah. We, take, we take elements of this and elements of that and we sort of blend it together into our own style. And mm -hmm. I think with drag, we've taken the humour, certainly the self-deprecation of, of drag yeah. from the British, but there's a, a, a polish to the American. And I think we've taken elements of both of those and blended them together to make the, the Australian style. And so, you yeah. design all these outfits as I well? I design all the outfits. Um, oh, look, you know, we all pinch things from places. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, there's got to be inspiration and there has to be. I mean, with drag, when you step into a costume, the 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 costume, the makeup, the yeah. hair. Once all of that happens, you you feel there's a subconscious different. Conscious move. That yeah, goes there is. With it. Yeah. Absolutely, there is. Even tonight, you'll see some of the drag queens walk on stage, and there are elements that they haven't perfected. Right. They will still uh, be walking a certain way because yeah. they're yes. not comfortable yes. in the heels, and, yeah. and and it really does take a while for you to be able to walk on stage and ignore all of those things yeah, yeah. and yes. still yes. look comfortable. And so there's there's so many elements to it. Overcoming all of those is actually quite difficult. Graham, a.k.a. Mitzi McIntosh, is the Simon Cowell of drag. He's invited Robin and I along to help him decide who's got the X Factor. As far as the competition goes tonight, I think, I think maybe... I mean, there's going to be a lot for you to see. So are we, are we scoring? Absolutely, uh, yes, yes. Of... Creativeness, the performance style, the originality to it. And it's very important to know that you're miming properly. You're looking at, you know, their face and their makeup and yeah. their wigs and whether they've styled their wig, whether their makeup's good, whether they've covered their beard line, whether they've, you know, <laughs> got rid of their eyebrows, things like that. And once I'm in full drag and you see me perform, right. um, then then that's your benchmark, obviously. Oh, well, uh, obviously. obviously. <laughs> the master. <laughs> I screamed out of you the other night from the car. Goodness, I think I finally figured out what the X in X Factor stands for. Excruciating. I thought the level of competition was quite tame, really. It was very respectful. Technically, and the best interpretation of the song with our very first contestant. Oh, there you go! The contest was a bit confusing for me, um, because I'm pretty sure that the winner was a girl. All right, Everly, it's yours. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for Everly. Which kind of went against the whole drag thing for me. Robin's even more confused. He's still in there with contestant number two. Um, he'll probably discover why Sydney's called Sin City any second now. After our eye-opening evening with wannabe drag queens, this morning Robin and I have undergone our own transformation, from ragtag balloonists to loyal British subjects. It's like a royal command. It is, isn't it? Yeah. British High Commissioner. Summoned. <laughs> Word has reached British High Commissioner, the Right Honourable Baroness Amos, that we're days away from competing in Australia's biggest balloon competition, and our company has been duly requested at her Sydney consular office. Not a bad view, though, is it? It's... it's not bad. What floor are we on? Um, 16. 16. <laughs> You can't, that probably means you can't stand at the window and look down. Don't joke. You I don't can know fly why. a balloon at thousands of feet, but you can't look out of a 16-floor window. It's weird. Oh, stop it! <laughs> I don't know, I, can't, I couldn't do that. This is a bit like waiting to see the headmistress. Well, OK, marginally better. We do get tea and sandwiches. Well, how do you do? Oh, Let me in. I'm very well and very pleased to meet you. This is Stephen Tompkins. Nice to meet you. Part of the Commonwealth, Australia has a Prime Minister, the Queen and the Queen's local representative, a Governor-General, looking out for her. Baroness Amos has dealings with them all as she represents the British Government in Australia. Stephen's brought you a present. Thank well, you. we... We have. We have. Is it going to be shocking you? Oh, when I open it? Well, oh. There's no joke in the box. Open it and so see. Are you sure? Mm. I promise, I promise. I, I like sure this. Did, did you do this yourself? Oh, yes. I don't believe you. No. <laughs> that, Fabulous. That is our day. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Thank you Designed very much. Designed and named after my daughter. That is that is lovely. It is the most sort of... That is great. ...pleasantly eye cut, and it looks well, great be against missed, the blue you? sky. You no, be exactly. Missed. Oh, no. We're going to leave our mark in Canandra. We're going to be, like you, representing Great Britain. 
in this uh, balloon festival in Canada. You better win, can I say? With, yes. Well, that's, that's, that's my only advice. not okay. to go away empty-handed. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to get a message saying that, uh, you know, you lost miserably. No pressure or anything. Oh, well, no, certainly no not miserably. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Or that even that you lost. And so, yeah. Now, you've, you've been here longer than us. I've been here about five months now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what tips do you think you can give us that we can take when we get to Canandra for this race? Well, the great thing, I think, from my perspective about uh, Australia is that um, people are incredibly warm and welcoming. It's very open, uh, but it's hugely competitive, especially around sport. Yes. And, of course, hugely competitive around sport with Britain. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so... Uh, Everyone will go all out to beat you. Right. I mean, right to the very last minute. So uh, just go out there, do your stuff, and win. And yes. win. That's all I have yes. to say to you. Win. Message received. So if they sledge us, should we sledge back? Now, I'm not going to give any advice. No, this, no. Uh, <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, I'm a diplomat. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, I wish you well. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. After weeks of training and now the backing of Baroness Amos, Robin and I are more than ready to push on to Canoundra and take on the Aussies. She was the personification of charm, though, wasn't she? She was. She was good lovely. advice. Give as good as you get, basically. Yeah. You're, you're funny with hikes, though, mate. I, that kind of surprised me. It's a long time since I've been up a high building. It was only the 16th floor. 200 miles west of Sydney, Canoundra is Australia's balloon capital. Surrounded by rolling hills, dotted with vineyards, orchards and olive groves, the town enjoys the kind of calm, stable weather that's perfect for year-round ballooning. A troubling drought has put big ballooning events on hold for the last few years, but thankfully the drought has broken and Canoundra's balloon challenge is back. If the rain holds off, that is. I have to say, the weather's not looking great, is it? No. Yeah. It well, I mean, it's not just us that gets affected, is it? It's the whole competition. It's disappointing for everyone if we can't get up. What do they do if they've only got, you know, four or five days for a balloon festival and the weather's bad? They'll grab every shot that they can. I mean, all the, they watch the weather day by day. And I think the forecast is better for tomorrow, so... I think there's a good chance we'll get tomorrow's slot in. Of course, we have to remember that we are carrying the hopes of a nation. And we have been given backing from Baroness Amos. And, uh, of course, if we do really well, then uh, Baron Bachelor might not be out of the question. That's all I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> As if she can be you. <laughs> we, live, we can only live in hope. For a town of 2,000 people, Canoundra's had an eventful history. It's the site of one of the world's greatest fossil discoveries, a 360 million year old fish, and where the infamous Australian highwayman Ben Hall staged a three day raid. Maybe that explains why a couple of British balloonists entering town doesn't cause the slightest of stirs. Well, here we are. We've arrived in Canoundra, the place that we've been building up for for a few weeks now. It's a very uh, sleepy little town. I mean, we're ready, but I don't know if Canoundra is ready. There's supposed to be uh, like a big meet and greet of all the balloonists tonight, and we'll be doing a, a night glow up against the, the night sky, which will look very f spectacular. And then tomorrow is the big one, the competition itself. So, uh, well, I feel, I feel quite nervous, but... Uh, Everything else seems to be a lot more subdued than I expected. But I, I, I don't know. No, nobody else seems as geared up for it as I am. I ha we haven't seen uh, any other balloons, apart from seeing Matt and Victor and meeting up with them again. I haven't seen anyone else who seems like they're here for the competition. Is everyone yeah. in town, then? Is, it, is the place yeah, yeah, a yeah, jump it's in? Everybody's it's, in it's, town. Good it's alive. The, uh, I think the number one guy in Australia is here oh, for the no. competition. Yeah. Yeah. Pah. Yeah. He's won the Nationals three times in a row. Well, in a row. Never mind. S just tell him that I've run them four times in a row. Yeah. So Robin so of Bachelor is you. here. Exactly. Well, what's the weather? Has our okay? infamy spread? Do they know we're coming? <laughs> they, they know we're coming. Did they hear about our landing at speed? Um, yes, it's proceeded. I yeah. think... <laughs> I think... Um, <laughs> yeah.
Before the big day tomorrow, we're to join all the other competitors in a night glow. All balloons will be inflated, tethered, and then the burners blasted to create a Chinese lantern effect that'll illuminate the sky. It's a friendly event and not intended to be a face-off, but that's certainly no excuse for not putting your best foot forward. In honour of our ballooning forefathers, we're going Victorian gentleman style. Well, we're picking up on what we've learned in the Sin City of Sydney and announcing our arrival by dressing in, an, in a spectacular way. We've made an effort. We've put ourselves on the map. We're here. They're quaking in their big Australian balloon <laughs> boots. of preparation and one day to get it right. That kind of pressure doesn't really make for a good night's sleep. <laughs> it's the morning of the competition. 20 competitors arrive at the briefing location. We're the only ones to have traveled so far to compete, which gets us a special kind of welcome. These guys from England, by the way, for the Aussies, they think they're pretty hot, so um, uh, get in there and give it your best. Don't let these pommies take any of our prize money back to England. Um, right. Okay, go fly, have fun, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. As ballooning is so weather dependent, competition tasks are never set until the morning of the event. Today, we'll be scored on how close we can fly to a couple of targets hidden in the Canoundra countryside. Right, well, this, this is it. This is the, uh, the competition we've been building up for for the last few weeks. We've just been given our instructions. We have to take off, fly over a specific marked point, drop a green marker, and on that green marker, we have to write down a map reference for a, a specified point of our choosing, four kilometres on. So I've got my tasks all laid out with the markers. Robin's... He's in control of everything. But we're very excited. We're really glad to be here. It's been an amazing journey, and this is the icing on the cake. So there's a fork in the road there. Yeah. Our marker is on a cross there by a line of trees. There's a line of trees, but the reservoirs aren't marked. I think it's over there. That yellow balloon is well on his way to it. Right. And he's the only one trying. So we ignore these three. The pilot of the yellow balloon is, is he one of the favourites that I should be watching him? Yeah, he is. Probably stick fairly close to him. He won't be too far away from the targets. He's flying around here a fair bit as well, so... Um, yeah, good man to stick to. While we're up in the air, Matthew and Victor are on the ground tracking us. We're in constant radio contact with them as they feed back vital information on the other competitors and, more importantly, what's happening with the winds. I just need some time to just feel these winds and get a feel of 
how they how they're going. You can feel more now. Yeah, we're dropping a bit. This wind is taking us where we need to be going, Robin. Yeah, yeah, it's suddenly exactly what we want. And what are the others doing? They're all going lower. Yeah, they're trying to search for it, I think. We should go straight on. No, we'll go right. No, straight on. No, we're going to go right east of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the cross there. Where? Right in the field, just where we, you were there pointing. There it is. Perfect. There's... Well done, well done. Right. It's going to be inches. Yeah. After six kilometres, we can drop a marker absolutely in the centre of the cross. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Microlight. It is. Hey, come on, concentrate on where we're going. We're starting to move right. How are you getting, uh, getting up towards the target there? How's, how's the run looking at the moment? At the moment, I'm happy. I've, I've got at 750 feet, I've got 240, and if that can stay, I'm over the field. But it's so variable. I've got to really, really concentrate on staying at the same height. Being able to spot the target is one thing, but being able to read the speed and direction of the winds is an entirely different skill. A skill, I confess, I just don't have, and Robin normally does. Except for now. Left. Just that talking, I've lost 150 feet. But now well, we're back on... Just stop talking and concentrate. That's what you do best. Yeah. We're going a long way away from the cross. We're going backwards. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I'm going to go back down and try again and just hope the wind gets back to that direction again. We've got 039 now. I'm going to go back down. Let's see how much gas we've got. got. Whoa, we're down to 10% on this tank. 20% on that one. We've got one full one left. Well, we're getting further away. Yeah. But when we sink, we'll, we'll go back that way. So I'm trying to get wind that takes... There's, that, there's the wind change. 350, we're heading north. Sorry. Well, it's not we were in we were in the swim. We were That we means were... nothing! <laughs> we we spread we've got a tank left. Never say you die. Let me just look for a wind that goes to the south. We've been blown wildly off course and are now entirely out of the running when it comes to the first task. Grab the radio. Our only hope is to get a solid wind reading from Matthew and Victor and use this information to push on to a second target onto which we'll hopefully drop a pink marker. Yeah. I've got about 320, 330. Yeah, 320, 330. Yeah, Robin, we've, got, we've still got that southerly on the surface, so um, 340s and then it turns left up high back to 270, pretty much what you've got. OK, yeah, but um, God, I'm having a hard time up here. The, the upper winds are all over the place, ever. Now, the pack seems to have a definite split. Yes. Here's the cross. I can't see it yet. It's on that road that all the vehicles are on. There it is. Right there in that brown yeah. field. Brown field. There it is. Got it. Well done. Perfect. Well done. Don't start worrying about other balloons. No. Find your tack. Yeah. yeah. See the X. Yeah. Stick and be inexplicably drawn to yes. it. Sa! Low down, we get we right. We follow this road yeah. to where it bends. One, six, three. We're, up, we're on a direct line with it now. One, six, three. Eyes on the prize, just reel us in. Robin, see really down low, this guy? Yeah. He's moving right now. You're right, he is. And we seem to Good have man. straightened up a bit, so okay, we need to drop right down, down and he's ground. really low down. Well, everyone else has gone past it. We are the only ones that are in with any chance at all. As the balloons around us rise, sink and drift off course, Robin resolutely hugs a freak gust of wind that appears to be taking us directly to the target. 
Take us through that gate. Yeah. There she goes. If the probability of an amateur golfer getting a hole in one is one in 12,000, then the probability of Robin and I hitting the target can't be far off that. And yet, maybe, just maybe... It'll reveal itself any second. There it is. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. And right there. We're right on it. <laughs> right on it. Now, is it best to completely unfurl it or just drop it just solidly? Just unfurl it and hold it tight. I'm going to go down now. I'm going back down. I'm going to go right over that cross. Absolutely. Right, come on, son. Bachelor, you're a bloody hero. Was there anything you're else? A bloody legend. Just very oh, gently. That's unbelievable. No, not yet, not yet. Get right over the top. Ready. Right over the top. Ready? Don't get it caught. Do it now. Yeah. That yeah. is how we do that. We are watching. It was uh, just a glorious moment. We were about this far off the ground at times and just hugged what little bits of right turn he could. But that kind of bent us round through an open gate, over the fence, completely over the X. My cricketing skills came in, dropped the bag right in the middle of the X. Do it now. Yeah, that is how we do that! Couldn't be any better. There's no way that anyone's getting any closer than that. So uh, we won that prize, which was absolutely phenomenal. We certainly experienced all forms of Australian life, from the the outback and cattle herding in Parachilna on horseback. To, you know, the Barossa Valley and the cricket match there. The way we've been welcomed by people and the, the sights that we've seen has made me really fall in love with Australia and Australians. We've had an incredible time, absolutely incredible, and today was uh, just a perfect way to cap it off.